Back in the year 1979, when Pink Floyd released one of the biggest selling albums of all time, another giant was introduced, the Kawasaki Z1300, and it was the heaviest motorcycle to ever come out of Japan at that time. It tipped the scales at over 300 kilos, which made Kawasaki's original Z1900 look like a middleweight. The huge 1,286cc liquid-cooled six-cylinder engine produced 120 horsepower, which was 15 more horsepower than the air-cooled Honda six-cylinder of the same era. The original Z1300 had carbies, and it was pretty thirsty on fuel. Later models switched to fuel injection, which not only alleviated the heavy fuel consumption problems, but it also gave the bike another 10 horsepower, which made it more powerful than many cars at the time. Quarter mile times were consistently around 11.5 to 12 seconds, and the big quacker had a top speed of around 140 miles an hour. In the late 70s, the phrase Universal Japanese Motorcycle, or UJM, was used to describe all the look-alike four-cylinder Japanese bikes on the market at the time. As groundbreaking as it was, and even though its engine was colossal, the Z1300 styling was nothing new, as the main emphasis was still on displaying the engine itself, a styling concept that had been around for decades. Late in 1980, Suzuki totally broke this mould, with their release of the GSX 1100S Katana. The Katana represented a very significant shift away from the traditional motorcycle designs. So radical was the Katana styling that many thought the bike would fail. And while initially sales were not that good, the Katana was eventually a sales success. The bike was actually designed by a former BMW designer, the same man that designed this bike. Can you see the resemblance? Apart from the radical styling, the Katana had low clip-on bars and a new style of instruments and gauges. Suzuki claimed the Katana was the fastest production motorcycle in the world. The 1,074cc inline four-cylinder engine produced 111 horsepower. And top speeds were reported as high as 147 miles per hour. Acceleration over a quarter of a mile was under 12 seconds, about the same as the previous bike, the Kawasaki Z1300. The BMW R80GS is considered by many riders as the very first adventure bike. While this thinking is not quite correct, and watch this documentary, it was the first large capacity motorcycle to be as equally at home on paved or unpaved surfaces. It was a true dual purpose motorcycle. Introduced in 1980, the 798cc Boxer twin-cylinder engine produced 50 horsepower, giving the bike a decent top speed of about 105 miles an hour, which made it very suitable to long-distance touring. The simple engine design, with everything very easy to access, made for very easy maintenance, not to mention the shaft drive, which was basically maintenance-free. It won the Dakar Rally four times, and by the mid-1980s, BMW had released the first of the Paris Dakar versions. These special editions featured their single sided swing arm, which made rear wheel removal extremely simple, protective engine bars, and a much larger fuel tank, which gave the bike a range of about 480 kilometres. It was a real adventure bike. Nobody else, not even the Japanese, were making a motorcycle quite like it at the time. BMW had indeed created its own market segment which still serves them very well right up to this very day. I doubt there isn't one motorcyclist in the whole world who hasn't watched Long Way Round. KTM must still be kicking themselves over their refusal to supply the bikes for Ewan and Charlie's adventure series. Early on in the 1970s, 
Honda kept their focus on producing four-stroke road bikes. And except for the Z1900, both Kawasaki and Suzuki focused on just two strokes. But unlike the others, Yamaha didn't place all their eggs in one basket. They produced both two and four strokes. Realising very early on that two-stroke engines were best suited to smaller and mid-capacity engines. The basis for this particular bike began in the year 1970 with Yamaha's 350cc two-stroke R5, then later to the RD350 and the RD400. But in 1980, Yamaha introduced a real giant killer, a true David amongst Goliaths, the liquid-cooled RD350LC. This two-stroke bike produced 47 horsepower and it weighed just 160 kilos which gave it a top speed of about 110 miles per hour and a quarter mile time in the mid-13 seconds. Generally speaking, two strokes have virtually no bottom end power, until they hit their power band that is, and this is why they feel so powerful. But what you are truly experiencing is not so much the power, but more the lack of it. And then the very sudden transformation to full power. like an on-off switch, and it definitely brings a smile to your dial. Back in those days, almost anyone could afford to buy a 350LC, and in the hands of a good rider, who was able to keep the engine spinning above 6,000 revs, the RD350LC could easily keep up with much larger capacity motorcycles. I've ridden an RD350, and I've owned an RD400, which were both excellent motorcycles, but the RD350LC took the riding experience to a whole new level. Although world superbike racing didn't start until the year 1988, in 1985, Suzuki released the GSXR 750, the very first so-called super sport motorcycle. It was a 749cc oil-cooled inline four-cylinder motorcycle which produced over 100 horsepower, far more than any previous 750s. It featured an aluminium frame of unprecedented light weight. The whole bike weighed in at a mere 176 kilos, the best power to weight ratio of any four-stroke bike in the world. This gave the GSXR overwhelming performance. The only bike at that time with a higher power to weight ratio was, ironically, also a Suzuki the Suzuki RG500 two-stroke, pictured here. No motorcycle before it had taken such huge steps forward. Compared to all other air-cooled and steel-framed motorcycles at that time, the Suzuki 750 was light years ahead of the competition. It was the first truly race-bred motorcycle, built for the road. Many of Suzuki's innovations on this particular model were copied in later years by all other manufacturers, making the Suzuki GSX-R750 truly a groundbreaking motorcycle. 1985 was also the year Yamaha released their mighty VMAX, the original muscle bike or power cruiser. The massive 1198cc V4 engine produced 145 horsepower and it dominated the bike's appearance. At that time, it was the fastest accelerating road bike ever made, and quarter mile times were in the 10 second bracket. Aside from the blistering acceleration it had, what set the VMAX apart from all other motorcycles of that era is that it had power everywhere. It wasn't a practical bike, and it was plagued with handling issues, not something that you'd really want on a bike capable of 150 miles an hour. But good handling wasn't the intended purpose of the VMAX and it gained a huge following and sales success. In 1988, the fourth generation of the Honda Goldwing was released, a totally redesigned Goldwing from the ground up. It had a 1500cc six-cylinder engine, which produced 100 horsepower and 150 newton metres of torque, which propelled it to a top speed of 118 miles an hour, and it covered the quarter mile in under 13 seconds. Of course, 
The gold ring wasn't about performance, it was built for comfort. I was just highlighting the fact that even though it was a behemoth, weighing in at 360 kilos, it was no slouch. It remained in production for over a decade, and if money was no object, you could buy the SE version, which had all the bells and whistles that you could put on a motorcycle, except for the kitchen sink. It was so far ahead of the competition that most rivals gave up even bothering trying to compete. The Honda Goldwing 1500 was without doubt a groundbreaking motorcycle. If you want to know more about Goldwings, watch this short documentary on the channel, which is just about Goldwings and nothing else. In 1990, Harley Davidson released the Fat Boy, with the new Harley Evolution engine, a soft tail frame and much beefier styling. With wide handlebars, FL8 style front forks, broad Valance mudguards and a large chrome headlight, it looks a bit like a bike straight out of the 1950s. The addition of twin shotgun exhausts and solid disc wheels with fat tyres added to the tough look. This bike looks so tough in fact, even the Terminator wanted one. I need your clothes, your boots and your motorcycle. <laughs> The Harley haters out there often criticise them for poor handling and being underpowered. But only someone that has never owned one would make such comments. You can't really ride a big bike like a normal motorcycle because your body weight has very little effect. A bit like a flea on a dog. Once you come to grips with this and realise riding a really big bike is all about counter steering, even something as big as an Electroglide handles as good as any other motorcycle on the road at normal riding speeds. A good motorcycle is not about absolute performance. Harley Davidson's feel solid, and the power is on tap at any cruising speed. It's how a particular motorcycle makes you feel. This is the most important thing with any bike, and the Harley Davidson Fat Boy makes you feel good. It was indeed a groundbreaking motorcycle. 1991 saw the reintroduction of the Triumph motorcycle brand. And while this particular bike wasn't groundbreaking in its own right, the Triumph Trident 900 was definitely a groundbreaking motorcycle for the Triumph brand itself. It formed the basis for many later models which would have followed in the years to come. Without it, Triumph may not exist today. Its 885cc inline three cylinder engine produced 100 horsepower, giving the bike a top speed of 215 kilometres an hour. With quarter mile times around 11 half seconds, it was plenty fast enough for any rider. While it was a fairly basic motorcycle, it was very reliable. And at that time, it was one of the most versatile and best looking motorcycles that money could buy. There are many motorcycles from the 80s and 90s, which have left a lasting impression on many riders' lives. But in 1993, when the Ducati Monster rolled onto the scene, it would change Ducati's fortunes forever, and it is one of the most instantly recognisable motorcycles ever manufactured. At a time when almost all bikes had a fairing of one type or another, the Monster was bare bones. It was versatile and a very powerful machine that would bring a smile to any rider who rode it. The very first model monster was powered by the Desmodronic 904cc air-cooled 90-degree V-twin, or L-twin. With its beautiful race-inspired trellis frame, upside-down forks, Brembo brakes and an engine for everyone to see, the rest is history.
monster is still with us today. Unfortunately, though, it barely resembles what the original monster was all about. Gone is that beautiful frame. And nowadays, the Ducati monster just looks like any other naked bike on the road. In 1994, just six years after the introduction of superbike racing, Ducati released this bike, the groundbreaking 916 Superbike. Although the 90 degree V-twin or L-twin produced less power than its force on the rivals at the time, it had a much more even torque spread. It featured a single-sided swing arm, underseat exhaust to improve aerodynamics, upside-down front forks, and the Ducati trellis frame. All this made for superb handling, and during the five years of production, the Ducati 916 won the World Superbike Championship title four times. To this day, the 916 is widely regarded as one of the best and most beautiful motorcycles ever designed. In 1999, just before the new millennium, we saw the release of another instantly recognisable motorcycle. It was the most overwhelmingly powerful, most aerodynamic and the fastest road legal motorcycle ever built. It was the Suzuki Hayabusa. And just like the Peregrine Falcon, which is what the word Hayabusa translates to from Japanese, this 1300cc monster could easily reach a top speed of over 190 miles per hour. The engine produced a massive 175 horsepower and propelled the Hayabusa over a quarter mile in close to 10 seconds flat. It was, indeed, and still is, a flawless motorcycle in every way, which is still in production to this day. I hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane. If so, please consider taking the time to hit the pause button and give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm quite sure there are at least a few other videos on the channel which you will find just as enjoyable as this one. Cheers and thanks for watching.